All right, so today I am live with uh, Jeremy here, who works at Hello. System76. System76 is a laptop manufacturer. They are not a laptop manufacturer that is making a, uh, you know, they're, they're not making a concept computer. They have been manufacturing devices that you could purchase on their site for a long period of time. He reached out to me. He's going to be testifying in support of a right to repair bill later this week. He is the only mm -hmm. laptop manufacturer that I know of that is currently producing devices that you can purchase that says that they support right to repair. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, glad to be here. Glad to talk to you. Uh, yeah, so System76, we've been in business for about 13 years. We sell Linux desktop computers and uh, laptops and servers. Uh, the desktop computers are mostly manufactured in the United States with some components coming from China, Taiwan, and South Korea. The laptops are assembled in the United States and the servers are also assembled in the United States. So um, I think I bring this up because it's important that we are probably one of the only manufacturers of computers that do the majority of our assembling in the United States. There is a Apple factory in Texas that was doing Mac Pros, but I'm not sure that they are still, uh, still building Mac Pros there. And we are in favor of right to repair. Uh, okay. We believe that right to repair is incredibly important for our customers. Uh, we want our products to have a very long lifespan. We want the products that we sold the first time we ever sold a product 13 years ago to continue to operate. Uh, and I think right to repair and having independent repair shops such as yours be able to service our products is very important to that. Okay, so what do you think is the difference between your... Because obviously you're running a for-profit business and, you know, Lenovo, Dell, HP, mm -hmm. Apple, they're all running for-profit businesses too. So where, where is the disconnect between their, their, their uh, outlook on right to repair and yours? Have you had debates internally with people you work with? Have you had investors say, what are you doing? This is going to screw up your business model. Or is this just something that was obvious to you? You know, we should just let people fix our yeah. products. There's no point to it. The, well, I think the last one, but to explain the other points, um, we don't really have investors. It was this was a completely seated company. So uh, it's owned by Carl Rochelle, who, who signed a letter in support of the Colorado right to repair bill and will probably testify as well. Uh, and we also, I think different from the other manufacturers, we price in the cost of maintaining units and the support for that unit in the purchase price of the unit. And doing so may have some disadvantage to us in the fact that being price competitive with Apple, who is able to, to uh, adjust prices based on the expectation that users will replace their equipment uh, quite regularly, I, I think that puts us at a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, we provide life term, lifetime support for the product uh, we have warranty periods where we provide replacements if necessary. And after that, after the warranty period, we provide the customer with details about how to repair the product, how to access parts, uh, things like that. So for a number of our laptops, we provide every single customer with schematics. Anybody who asks for schematics can, can get access to it for a number of our products. Uh, parts are very easy to come by. I, I think that the major distinction and reason why we're able to do that is because we price in the idea that this product will survive 10 plus years rather than two years. Okay, so that was going to be one of my one of the questions that I thought was going to be contentious because it has been with other vendors. And let me just explain. So mm -hmm. what, what, when uh, the, I really started to get focused on right to repair was after a law firm called Kilpatrick and Townsend called me and said we you know t we want some of these videos taken down because they are showing schematics in them of, of products. And I I remember coming up with a T-shirt and a mouse pad that I was selling that said schematics or die. And the very <laughs> specific reason I did that was because I realized that as time went on. Many uh, people who are who are um, activists for a particular cause wind up watering down their uh, watering down what it is they ask for, coming up with compromises that don't make sense. And what that did sure. is it kind of forced me to make this line in the sand, where if there is a right to repair that doesn't allow the end, you know, someone to be able to purchase a schematic from the vendor, then it's not a real right to repair. And I've spoken with other hardware manufacturers that claims that they support right to repair. And then when I said, how would a repair shop subscribe? To, with, to a program with you or be able to purchase a schematic from you? How does that work? And they go, oh, uh, yeah, you can't do that. And uh, there, it's been... Yeah. 
and it's been contentious because you know people will say well, you're kind of picking on them. They're trying to do the right thing, and then I'll say, you know, I'd, I'd really like <laughs> to be able to pat you on the back there, but if I can't get a schematic, you and Apple are just I, I don't see where there's a large a large yeah. difference there. And some people have said the reason that they can't give us uh, even sell a schematic if they wanted is because someone else is designing their boards, whether it's Intel or another OEM, and they have an NDA with that OEM that doesn't allow them to be able to issue the schematic even if they want it. So how does that well, differ with you? they are absolutely right about that. They are right about that, that the, the ODM, whoever is manufacturing the motherboard, if you look at Dell, HP, Lenovo, they all use a pretty small set of Taiwanese ODMs. Uh, they, use, they use Pegatron, they use Quanta, they use Compal, they use Foxtron or Foxconn, sorry, um, which Apple also uses. And those ODMs do huge mass of production. So they're doing millions of units for every model. And they enter into agreements that they will compete on how secretive they can be with their designs, such that Dell may know less about the product and HP may know less about the product, but they may be getting this roughly the same motherboard uh, because they both contract for a similar like 13 inch design at the same time with Pegatron. Pegatron may design a motherboard that roughly fits both of their needs and neither one gets to see the design. Then they also contract with a company to do firmware like inside or AMI. And um, the, the unique thing about us is that the company that we get our motherboards from, Clavo, has been open with us about providing schematics and providing data sheets for, for parts. Uh, pretty much any part I ask for data sheets, I, I have gotten access to. And they've given us the right to share that with customers and with anybody who, who uh, is contracting with customer to do repairs. So for example, I'm, I'm talking to you on one of our products. Uh, this product is the Lemur Pro. Uh, unique to this product also is we have open source firmware. We use something called Coreboot, and part of that design process requires the schematics. So if you had to do a board level repair on this, unfortunately, I don't have board views, but I have extremely detailed schematics. And I've done board level repairs on this unit before. I've soldered, I've resoldered uh, power management chips because they are prone to failure. I've dealt with liquid damage a few times. I have, um, I've soldered things onto the embedded controller for debugging. So the, the schematics have been very helpful in that. And I'm very grateful that, that we do have a hardware partner that allows us to share them. So I do definitely understand that uh, a lot of hardware manufacturers are still forced by their legal agreements to not share these, these things. However, the first state that passes a right to repair act will completely change this industry. No longer will Taiwanese companies be able to contract with American companies this way. No longer would they be able to hide their schematics so that even, even Dell may not be able to see schematics for a motherboard. Even authorized repair shops may not be able to see them. And that's not even talking about the independent repair shops. So I, I do think the industry is, is very different um, than the way we think about it. I think, I think in general, the companies like Apple, Lenovo, HP, Dell, I think they think about the product as a consumable, one that is provided at as low a cost as they can make it at. Um, margins are insanely low, like 5% or less, uh, even for Apple products. And then try to build in the fact that the user will not be able to get repairs, even if they find an authorized repair shop. The number of times a, a Mac has been brought to a, a genius bar and they've just figured out a way to replace it is insane. And I'm sure you get a lot of customers that, that bring a Mac to you that was refused by the authorized repair shops, right? Yeah.
So th this is very interesting because it really shows you how far down the rabbit hole it goes, even if, because one of the things that I've found, you know, if, if when I used to be on these forums where people were doing board repair, is when you're when someone says, I have an HP whatever, they'll say, I don't care about that. Give me the number on the board. It'll be compel this or quanta that, and you'll find a schematic for a yep. compel this or quanta that. And it's not a schematic for an A, you know, a Dell Insper in this or an HP that. And uh, so, so exactly. the, I, 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 was, I was aware of that, but I, but for some it isn't. It just didn't click at the time that this may not actually even be a decision for Dell, for HP. I think it would be for Apple because the schematics are not quanta or compil schematics. They say Apple all over them, so they are they, they are in, uh, in control of that part. But it is interesting that right. for many other manufacturers, it may not even be a choice for them, to, even if they wanted to. Which is which which was depressing to me because even if someone wanted to open a right to repair oriented company, they. May May not even be able to. So if you can't get the schematic because the company that makes the board won't provide it, and you can't get the chips that go on the board because the company that makes the motherboard tells Intersil and Texas Instruments and Renaissance don't provide them, then even if you wanted to create that type of company, the capacity wouldn't exist. So how is it that... Uh, do, would did this just so happen to be a coincidence that the company that you were doing business with for motherboards made this available, or was this something that in the very beginning you guys said we are only going to work with a motherboard manufacturer that is uh, more open in their philosophies? I, I think it's a little bit of both because we are a small company. We have to contract with with a company that does multi vendor designs. So a Clavo motherboard may be used in a, a whole bunch of different designs. We have the largest sales in the United States for the specific Clavo models that we sell. And that, uh, but there are other vendors, especially in Europe and South America and Asia that sell the same motherboards. And I think the requirements for all of us are that this is something that we can, uh, we can uh, appropriately manage as though it were our own product, as though we manufacture the motherboard. And for us, especially now that we are developing firmware for the majority of, of our laptop line, uh, we have to have as much information as they would provide to the firmware developer. So for Dell, they contract this stuff out where they will tell, they will tell Compal, we just want a laptop motherboard that fits inside of this chassis and this company is going to manufacture the chassis. Go figure it out yourselves. Go find the firmware developer. Talk to AMI or Inside or, or Phoenix and find somebody to make the firmware. And most of the development process happens in Taiwan. Most of it happens under very tight cartel-like uh, conditions where essentially there's a cartel of, of very, very large companies that manage a very huge amount of laptop sales going through the major vendors, Lenovo and HP and Dell and, and so on. So Apple is a little bit different in that they own the majority of the design. And that is actually a decision that they've made that even though it costs a little bit more, they will design in-house as much as they can. Uh, however, this hasn't been really helping the customer. They, as we see with the M1 designs, now all of the RAM is on die. Now the disk is soldered. So the, the user serviceability of an M1 laptop is maybe about the same as, I, I don't know, maybe about the same as, well, it, it's Cell really similar than iPhones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what I was trying to think of. So it's very similar to the iPhone in design, uh, where if you want to replace something, you basically have to break the thing. Uh, to get it open and and clearly not that is not uh, an intended use case. What makes Clevo separate from let's say Compal or Quanta or any of the other manu motherboard manufacturers where they're open to making mm -hmm. this available and the others are not? Clevo isn't the only one. There are other ones that are are what's called white box vendors, where instead of contracting with a company to to deliver a set number of motherboards. And those motherboards only go to that company and there's some exclusivity. They will instead uh, contract with a number of companies to share a single design. So you lose some ind individuality in your design, but uh, you gain some of the, the, the good things from that. Um, you gain some ability to manage the design yourself where in, instead of them entering into some tight agreement where nothing can ever be shared with the customer, 
they treat you in a way that you could then pass on those benefits to the customer. They give you all of the, the schematics, data sheets for, for components, access to component purchases, so on and so forth, under the idea that you will be the front for that in a different country. And most of the Clavo vendors are importers, where all they do is just bring the product in and then sell it. We are different where we bring the product in and we develop firmware for it. And that firmware has a bunch of improvements over the standard firmware that these products ship with. Uh, that uh, it, it boots much faster. It's completely open source. The embed controller firmware is open source. We have a custom fan curve. Uh, we have custom power management. Things like that are built into the product. And since we are able to do that, since we are given the tools to do that, we're able to forward that to, to uh, our customers. Whereas a, a Dell model developed with Compal may be under an agreement where Dell is not able to do that. Even if they were able to do that, I doubt that Dell would want to, uh, since a lot of their competitiveness comes from being able to drive their price down due to the idea that people will be replacing laptops every two years when they should be lasting 10 years. I find it particularly interesting that a much smaller company seems to have more control over their supply chain and more control over their own product than a company worth, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars or tens of billions. That, that, that's it's all about margins. Now, that, yeah. that's the next question that it's I have. It's about margins, so... So the next question that I have for you is, I remember running a supply company where we sold LCD screens and other parts for hard to find machines about 10 years ago. And our selling point was that, you know, there's not going to be a single stuck pixel. If you get a bad screen, I will overnight you a replacement and have a return label in the box to send it back. You're not going to have to wait 15 days and pay for your own shipping. We pre-test every screen. If you blow a backlight fuse or something, mm -hmm. you can call and I'll actually pick up the phone and walk you through replacing it all. And we would cost maybe three or four more dollars than the cheapest one on eBay. And if I put my price like a dollar above the cheapest one on eBay, I would go from selling 11 or 1200 a day to selling like 15. So uh, how how, how yep. have you been able to maintain, so you said you bake into the cost of your product the fact that you're going to be offering after-sale support and service for the product, as well as you know right. just having a right to repair-oriented supply chain. So how have you been able to stay competitive with companies that have much larger advertising budgets than you that are also selling at considerably lower margins that are better known as a much smaller company? Like, yeah. what, what's kept you competitive well, the in margin, the business? Then? Dell may not be getting the margin at their level, but... But Compal certainly is, or Quanta or, or Pegatron. There is a point at which um, I, I believe Clavo does not does not rip us off as much as Compal would. And when you when you talk about the multi million dollar number of machines that they sell for a model, uh, I think they're perfectly fine with low margins for those. But even with with the margins being lower for Dell uh, or Apple, I, I I think we're still price competitive. If you were to design out a System76 laptop, most of the time we will be coming in around the same price as a similarly spec Dell XPS 13. There may be some things that, and and honestly, the I I have a Dell XPS 13 uh, from a few years ago, and uh, our product quality has caught up and probably exceeded it. So I, I think somebody is definitely eating up the margin at a lower level than Dell gets to see it. And we've seen this as well with our, de with our, with our desktop line. When we were able to in-house the design of chassis, we were able to increase our margins significantly, uh, but keep the price around the same. So I think maybe there's some organizational issues at play that people do it the standard way, have lower margins, and uh, still end up with very similar prices. Um, it used to be the product quality was a little better for Dell. Now I think we've caught up and, and even exceeded. The Ultrabook I'm talking to you on has a bigger battery than the Dell XPS 13. It's lighter. It has a similar size. It has a better keyboard, better touchpad. I'm not really sure what the XPS 13 offers, but they're priced similarly. Um, so, so to answer your question, I really don't know uh, because <laughs> if it was just, they have lower margins, the pricing for a lot of the, the, especially Dell products, which I'm more familiar with, doesn't really reflect them having lower margins. 
I suppose, what, what, what is your client acquisition process to get people to buy your machines when you're competing with companies that are way more well-known, that have much higher advertising sure. budgets? Because like what you're doing is, like the fact that you're able to, that your company is able to employ the people that they do and continue to, to run and, uh, you know, and stay in business when you're competing with giants is, is very impressive to me. So like, what do you... Yeah, there's, the, it's mostly because we have a niche. And that, that niche is uh, is Linux computers. So we sell computers with Ubuntu and with our own Linux distribution, Pop! OS. And this is something that the other suppliers do very rarely. And it, when they do do it, barely support it. So if you want to buy a computer that runs Linux and you want to have lifetime support, there are very few options. And especially if you go on to more professional computers that need to have more than 32 gigs of RAM, a lot of our competitors are topping out at 32 gigs or even 16 gigs. The MacBook Pro, the the max you can configure the M1 MacBook Pro is 16 gigs. And of course, it's on chip. It helps with performance a bit because, because the RAM is on, on the CPU die. But it means the customer can never upgrade it. And 16 gigs is just not enough for our customers. So I think we have a niche that's kind of outside of the typical... Uh, typical laptop market. And I, I honestly think that the mistake is being made by the big vendors that are not targeting our market. Because eventually, uh, we are just completely seeing laptop sales that are at the lower end get completely replaced by mobile phones, where it is rare that I meet somebody out just randomly who still owns a laptop. The people who still own laptops are professionals who use the laptop for work or something that a mobile phone just cannot handle. And a lot of that for us is software developers who need to use Linux, who need, who need hardware that, that is more performant than what the competition is offering. And that puts us in a place where we have basically no competition. What do you think the people that are advocating for right to repair, like myself and other organizations, are getting wrong in either their messaging or in their legislation that, if, was, if it was changed, would, uh, would, would cause more broader support and more progress? I, I think the biggest problem right now is that uh, we are treating this as a independent repair versus the computer company's fight, when it may be a little more nuanced than that. Uh, it may be that the computer companies actually would benefit from right to repair legislation, especially the American computer companies. Uh, they are getting, a lot of them are getting screwed over by their ODM, uh, especially ODMs in Taiwan that basically eat up the margins of, of every American laptop vendor. And a lot of them don't understand that their customers would benefit greatly and that they could actually increase prices and come up with different revenue streams if they were to provide long-term support for products in a way that utilized independent repair providers and, and had a stronger supply chain for independent uh, people, either repair providers or even the consumers themselves to buy parts. The secretiveness of mainly Taiwanese companies making chips and motherboards. Uh, when, when I talk about the, the laptop that we have, I think the most secretive chip on the motherboard is the embedded controller. It's manufactured by ITE. And until recently, we were having quite a bit of trouble with ITE, uh, with getting data sheets. But we did eventually convince our our ODM to provide data sheets for the, for the embed controller. And using those, we were able to produce uh, firmware for that device, open source firmware. So I, I think that the fight is really, uh, is really against the companies that are writing the NDAs, not the companies that are signing them. Now, let's say that the issue is with these ven the, these uh, o ODMs in, in tai Taiwan that are, that are creating these NDAs. If a right to repair law is a passed in the United States, how would that affect anybody there? I mean, wouldn't they just be able to say, I, I don't have to provide you with any of this, you know, good luck enforcing this in another country? Uh, I think a lot, uh, I think there would be a lot of enforcement being, uh, I think there would be a lot of missed enforcement. Yes, I do think so. But it would be that case anyway, even if it was, uh, 
even if it was a worldwide right to repair act, there will always be somebody trying to get out of it. But the thing is, if one United States state passes a right to repair law, there is no state that that any of the laptop manufacturers can afford to ignore. Even Wyoming, if it passes there with, with 650,000 people, that is still a big enough market that I don't think any vendor is going to want to uh, to ignore that market or say we can't ship laptops to Wyoming. So that and uh, it, it really pains me that the bigger states have all failed so far. Uh, if California had passed right to repair, there would be basically it would there would be no laptop on the market that would not immediately adapt to that circumstance, regardless of the supply chain. The supply chain would definitely adapt. If Colorado passes it, that's a six million people market. I don't think it can be ignored. I think okay. there would be enforcement that would be that would be gotten around, but um, in the end, I think most companies would follow right to repair legislation if it was passed in just one state. Okay, yeah, the California not not passing it makes it difficult because when I go to other states that are more conservative, they'll say, "Has anybody else passed this?" And the opposition will say, "Even California said no." And they'll go, "Really? You mean the state that says that my chair gives yeah, me, may give me cancer didn't pass it?" And then I'll be like, "Oh, f me!" Like, "Oh no, I'm screwed." The moment I see them start laughing. At this that. this is a state though. California is a it, it's a tricky thing because California can be absolutely the most conservative state about certain issues. When you think about immigration. A lot of the the uh, people on opposing certain immigration uh, mechanisms, like the H one B, which the H one B is, as far as I know, the only legal way anybody can come here without without being married to somebody or or being related to somebody. Uh, the H one B and the there's another one that provides for even higher skilled people to immigrate. Uh, Silicon Valley had had a, a number of representatives against increasing the number of H-1B uh, people in the lottery. So I, I think California is, is completely full of shit when they, it, of course, right to repair wouldn't pass there. They, it is a completely backward state. Please do not move there. Uh, I, I saw your, your video about moving. Don't move to California because if you think New York is getting bad, California is even worse. It wasn't on my um, list, but I appreciate it. They, yeah, so so on certain things, certain issues, maybe right to repair is one of them. Definitely anything that Silicon Valley would be damaged. And that was immigration. That was right to repair, consumer rights. California is going to be on the wrong side of. So uh, our biggest enemy in this fight right now is Silicon Valley. I wish Silicon Valley would realize that it could actually benefit them if they were able to negotiate for better terms with their ODMs. Because every Silicon Valley company is essentially a front around some Chinese manufacturing capability. So if we were able to negotiate a little bit better that you could not enter into the United States without having these certain requirements met, it's worked basically every time that that uh, requirements have changed. It doesn't matter which state changes them. Losing any state is enough market lost that I, I really think that uh, the CTA and all of the companies it represents should think deeply about the positives to right to repair for them. Wow. Are there any misconceptions about your company or the products that you produce that you'd want to clarify while, while you're uh, on this video? The, well, the biggest misconception, and this is one that I've perhaps exposed a lot of, is that we are just a rebrander of laptops. Every single laptop company, except maybe Apple and maybe some Google Chromebooks, is essentially a front, is essentially putting a sticker on something manufactured in China that was then shipped through Taiwan, then shipped to the United States. But there are different levels of what putting that sticker on means. For Apple, it means completely owning the design and completely disallowing anybody from accessing components. For us, it means doing firmware for the device. It means making sure it runs with Linux. 
and it means supporting the device for for the lifetime of the product which we think to be 10 plus years not two years or one year or whenever you drop it on the floor and the screen breaks uh, but however long that thing can last uh, before it basically explodes. Which, by the way, I've got a MacBook here that's basically exploding. Uh, What's wrong with it? So, well, nothing is technically wrong with it, except the battery keeps swelling. Uh, I've had it since 2010. It's a 2010 15-inch MacBook Pro. About every two years, the battery swells, making the touchpad not work because it's click pad and the battery prevents it from being clicked. And of course, the only way to fix that is to rip the battery out and replace it, which costs about $100 each time. And the charger frays. So I haven't used it in, in probably four years, but uh, in that six years I had it and I was using it, I had to replace the battery and charger each three times. Jeez. Yeah, so <laughs> anyway. I, I rant a lot. I don't know if you know that. I noticed. I like you it. rant a lot too, though. So maybe it's fair. Yeah. So, <laughs> what would be necessary for more for any of this? Is is it a complete and total pipe dream for any of this sort of motherboard manufacturing to ever happen within the United States, or to ever happen from well, other smaller providers? It is right not a pipe dream at all, and it is actually beginning to happen. So. Uh, we are one of a number of different companies in this kind of open computing space where we develop open source software to run the computer, open firmware. There are other companies too. There's Purism. Uh, there is uh, Oxide. Oxide does servers. Purism does laptops. Uh, we are all interested in manufacturing motherboards in the United States. It's, it's definitely not a pipe dream. At the very least, the design can be done in the United States to where uh, the schematics and the board, the board layout files are all, all owned by uh, companies in the United States. We will be moving manufacturing of laptops into the United States. Uh, we're doing most of our desktop manufacturing in the United States. For laptops, we bring the motherboard in from, from Taiwan and it ships from Taiwan through a, manufac uh, a manufacturing facility in China. Uh, so kind of removing those steps in the supply chain is definitely something we're interested in. And that will give us the ability to open source the design. So we want to have a laptop motherboard design that is GPL version three, where every single individual on the planet will be able to not only see the schematics, but see the actual board layout files be able to even edit them and provide them to a manufacturer, a PCB manufacturer, if they want to produce it. Uh, that is something we're very interested in. And for a number of products, we're already doing that. We have non-computer non products. Uh, we have a, a keyboard that we're manufacturing, a mechanical keyboard. It's called the Launch Configurable Keyboard. The design is completely GPL version 3. It's open source. Uh, anybody can view the files on our GitHub account. And this will be manufactured in a facility in China. But we own the design, and the design is open source. Anybody can view it. Uh, we have another board design called the Thaleo IO, which is an IO controller, basically an IO expander for our desktop line, our desktop line being called Thaleo. Uh, Thaleo has open source chassis. So every chassis is on our GitHub account as well. And, and I, I think there's enough companies pushing this and wanting to have uh, something that is not only just right to repair friendly, but goes beyond that where it's open source design, where there is no fee to view the design. There is no documentation, no, no legal stuff you have to sign. It's just up there online, just like open source software. Uh, so I, I do think that will happen eventually, and that is definitely the future we are working towards. Okay, so sorry to completely bombard you with small questions on details. Before you said like you would be able to have, let's say, schematics for some of the for, uh, the boards, but you wouldn't be able to have board views. Now, I was speaking to Paul Daniels, who made the open board view and flex board view software that I use, and thank God he did. I don't know if you saw the mm -hmm. early videos where I was using Landrex Testlink from 1995. It was 
He saved my uh-huh. life there. And he said, part of the issue when he speaks to manufacturers is the messaging. So when we say board view, the manufacturer hears the documentation necessary for you to just print the board somewhere else, like every single layer, you know, the, the sure. width of the tracks. Whereas what yeah. we're actually looking Which at is... Which is what we want to provide eventually. Yeah, whereas yeah. The, the repair people... I, I get what you're saying. Yes, yeah, so the, the repair person so is asking want, for is like yeah. top layer, bottom layer, that's it. Uh, do, do you think that the that there's a, a, a loss in translation there that is causing people to say no whereas they otherwise would say yes? We've had pieces of the board view before, and I think maybe maybe there is a loss in translation where when you tell them board view, they really do think the files to manufacture because um, there's more to the to the back end of this to describe for every single Intel chip and AMD chip uh, that they manufacture, if there's a new line, they provide a number of files for every partner so that they can go and use that as the reference design for a new motherboard. Those files are nowhere near what you'd need to have an actual motherboard working in an actual laptop. But they do show what you'd need to actually print something out, have a PCB manufactured that would function and would boot up and would have display output. The manufacturers then take that design and modify it. And I think when you say board view, I think you're right that they think you're talking about that specific design, which nobody can share because of the way in which they they acquired it. They acquired it through NDAs with AMD or with Intel. Uh, so yeah, probably there's something where if it was very useful and you just needed to see the components labeled in a more searchable manner, uh, they could probably deliver something like that. Uh, when I asked for board view previously, I thought they understood what I mean, what I meant. And seeing as we already had the schematics and the schematics label out, uh, the position of components a little bit. Um, I didn't think it would be that much of a stretch to have board view files, but maybe you're right. Maybe I didn't ask correctly. Yeah, because I didn't um, even think of this until Paul brought it up. But I mean, I would never, to be clear, I would never advocate for a, a, p- a piece of legislation or ask for something that allows me to click a button and reprint your product. Uh, I want the bare minimum necessary for me to be able to do a basic repair. So, well, like, I want to be. I want to be even more clear that that is what I want you to do with our products eventually. That's awesome. We actually want to have a design that anybody will be able to access the raw design, the original design. And we've done that with a number of products, just not with laptops yet. So, so I, I think there is, and we're a profitable company. Maybe that's the thing to take away from this is there are ways to profit even with this legislation in place and maybe even profit more. We are looking forward to this legislation so that we can leverage our upstream providers to provide even more details about the products that we sell. Okay. Now, uh, going back to the, 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 the prior question that I had, which is the with, with regards to uh, the... What was I saying? Oh, I completely blanked there for a moment. One second. Ah, yes, with the, with the manufacturing in the United States being a pipe dream. It, what would be necessary for a motherboard to actually be created in the U.S. or for any of this stuff to be done here? Is it is it like the the, the lack of money people are willing to invest in it, or is it just that the infrastructure has been built somewhere else and trying to catch up here would take ten or twenty years and it's impossible? Or is this something where if someone who had a gigantic pile of money said, "Here's a gigantic pile of money. I want to see something made in the U.S.," it could actually happen? It could definitely happen. It could definitely happen. Uh, we So we've gotten pretty close to laptop board designs. Uh, our newest in-house PCB design for the keyboard, it has a fully functional USB 3.2 Gen 2 dock. And it was pretty complicated to lay out. High speed, sim- high speed signals everywhere, uh, eight layers. It's getting close to the complexity required for a laptop motherboard. Uh, and we contracted with with a company in in Taiwan for manufacturing. The reason being that the cost was was about half what it would be to manufacture in the United States. I think that is the major problem right now is uh, the equipment. Once you own it, 
I think the PCB lines can be quite cheap, even in the United States. But I think a lot of the the PCB houses in the United States don't have equipment for the most expensive designs, uh, which motherboard designs would be. And they, they don't have training. So starting up a new line uh, is very difficult here in the United States. But with enough money, I think it would be you could get down to the right cost. It would just be about controlling labor costs, which can be very labor costs can be very low for PCBs if they're manufactured in a fairly automatic uh, way. What China is able to do is they are able to ignore the labor costs. They don't have to come up with ways to automate the process because it is so cheap to hire people. When you can hire somebody for $1 an hour to work on a PCB line, uh, justifying replacing them with a machine is a lot harder than if you have to pay them $15 an hour. Interesting. I'm, well, I'm not saying people should be paid $1 an hour. I'm just stating the realities of the economy we live in. Yeah, I'm that sure China is up. competing because people are so cheap there. Well, but I think Tesla has a, lo has a number of similar manufacturing facilities in the United States. So it is definitely possible. Yeah, I'm not sure how Tesla manages to make that happen. Uh, and and do all. I mean, obviously, I guess part of it is that their cars cost way more money than the competition's cars. But at the same time, a lot of the stuff that 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 uh, they they charge a lot of money for. It's like find a, a forty six thousand dollar electric car with a three hundred fifty three mile range. Like I, when I started looking at it, I thought this is overpriced crap. And then I started digging in. It's okay. Let me find a competitor that's forty six k with three hundred fifty three mile. Ra oh, doesn't exist. Yeah, so that's it, right. They're in, I guess they're in the same space as us. They don't really have a competitor for the niche they're in. And uh, it's uh, what Tesla, I think they have, like their direct to customer model cuts out a lot of wasted money. You go to a dealership and you buy a car, they will sell it at lower than MSRP. They'll give you 0% financing. The reason they're able to do that is because they're actually being sold the car at maybe 40% below MSRP. And so they still have huge margins. So I, I think it's a very competitive business and one where Tesla has been able to cut out some of the stuff that makes cars cost more such that um, they're able to have manufacturing of a number of parts in the United States and able to make a car that is cost competitive with things that are electric vehicles that have the same range. Well, I've definitely learned a lot from this conversation. I'm sure a bunch of other people will have as well. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I really, really appreciate it. I, I learned a lot and I have, I feel better that I came away from this sure. conversation. Uh, is there anything you'd want to end it on? Anything that I haven't mentioned or asked that? Well, uh, I'm just looking forward to the hearing on Thursday, and I hope it doesn't end up the same way as the other ones have. What, what are you planning to say at that? Because I know most of those hearings, there's usually a timer in front of me, and people will say, Lewis, you need to tell them this. You need to tell them that. Why didn't you tell them this? And they won't realize that I have a little thing that in 90 seconds buzzes or beeps at me. So what are you going to fill your 90 seconds or two minutes with? I, I might have a prepared speech. I really don't know. Uh, I just want to point out to them that because there will be plenty of people there that will say, well, right to repair, consumer rights, blah, blah, blah. I want to point out to them that manufacturers of laptops can still survive and in fact thrive in environments where right to repair has been passed. That's what I, I want to point out. I think that's a good thing to point out because what, what the lobbyists will typically say is, well, it's not even about us. Think of the smaller manufacturers. Think of our, you, you don't want to destroy them, do you? So if there's someone that actually is one of the smaller manufacturers there that says, you know, that the, 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 the tech net yeah. chill doesn't speak for me, that would be, uh, that would be very helpful. Yeah, we don't agree with the CTA or with tech net. And we are based in Colorado, so we're talking about 50 plus jobs in Colorado for our manufacturing. These are people who are working manufacturing computers uh, in a way that you would think, based on the arguments from the opposition, would be impossible. And in fact, passing this law will help our business and will help to hire more Colorado workers. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that at least makes them feel bad 
about throwing this bill away. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing maybe there's a 10% chance that this bill actually gets out of committee. Uh, just, I, I'm, I'm pretty disillusioned seeing all the other hearings. And uh, it's been a year since this bill was scheduled to be, to have a hearing. Uh, it had to be revised and COVID prevented the previous hearing from happening. So I, I think, I think unfortunately right to repair for electronics still has a lot of way, a lot of way to go. And those of us who really want to see it happen are probably going to have to be working on it for the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, what I've learned but is once that one state decides to make it happen, it'll be good. What I've learned so far is that the hearing itself, is, its purpose is not for them to decide whether or not the bill gets passed. The purpose of the hearing is often to demonstrate, to the, that's my opportunity to demonstrate to the public that the government doesn't actually work. Because you'll have, you know, sometimes there'll be, <laughs> like, the, 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 you'll have someone say, if this bill passes, a microwave will explode, or, and then they'll say, any questions? Nope. It's like, what? And you're not allowed to say anything in response to it, or you'll have right. people that are just playing with their phones yeah, and yeah, not yeah. listening. So that's my opportunity to showcase to the public that this isn't working and maybe get them to be a little bit more excited or a, bit, a little bit more involved or think to themselves, man, you know, that that's my district. I want to vote out the person that just was like nodding when they said that the, the microwaves explode. And, um, and what I'm really hoping to do next year that's is a great. direct ballot initiative where, uh, where this goes directly on the ballot. So it's like, okay, you know, who do you want to be your senator, your congressperson, judge, DA, whatever, right to repair, yes or no. I, I, I see that as the way that, uh, the only way of this moving forward because I don't trust any politician to actually do the right thing in this instance. And even if they want to do the right thing, they're going to be afraid if they do it of getting in trouble. I, I, trust, the, I trust the general public. I trust the people that, uh, that disagree with me with, on everything politically, that think I'm a complete asshole when it comes to you know, their own self-interest on a ballot to vote in favor of this more than I do a politician. And I'm hoping that over the next year and a half, sure. I'll, I'll be able to, to make that possible. Awesome. It. I hope so too. All right. Well, I'll thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, have a nice day. All right. Yeah, you too.